We are so excited to see you here tonight. I have to say this is one of my favorite nights of the year. Uh, that's been true since I came in as a freshman in 1984. Uh, I served on orientation committee the year after that, and uh, we did a great job too, although I have to say you guys are a lot better dressed than we were uh, back in 1985. Um, but what, it's amazing just to welcome you uh, freshmen and transfers, parents and students, and maybe some other family members. Uh, we, we celebrate your coming into what is a remarkable uh, Christian community, a place where God has gathered you together for a new spiritual home for the coming years that uh, we believe will make a difference in your life for the whole rest of your life. I want to speak this evening about um, some of the commitments that Wheaton College uh, makes to its students. I want to speak about the commitments that you make to one another and to this community as you enter into it. But more deeply than that, I want to remind you tonight of the commitment that your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ has made to you. And all in the context of what I believe is distinctive about a Wheaton College education. I want to speak about this for about 15 minutes, so settle in uh, just a little bit. And I want to say three things about this Wheaton College community. And uh, presumably you have a little bit of an idea about this already or you wouldn't be here, but I, I still want to highlight important aspects of our mission. And the first one, and perhaps is the most important, and that is that Wheaton College is Christ-centered. What you see on the sign at the front of campus for Christ and His Kingdom, what you see over the portals of Edmund Chapel, at least if you can read a little bit of Latin, for Christ and His Kingdom there as well, uh, is not merely a motto for us, it is a living reality on this campus. Our mission statement as a college begins like this, Wheaton College serves Jesus Christ and advances His kingdom. I want you to reflect for a moment this evening on how rare that calling is, because most of the colleges and universities in this country started out on distinctively Christian foundations. And yet so few have remained true to that mission. And yet here tonight you are at an institution that has been here for 156 years and counting, still standing for Jesus Christ. One of our faculty members... One of our faculty members told me that she was visiting another university. It's a name that you would recognize. It is frankly one of the top ranked schools in the world. And as she was visiting with her family, she came upon a plaque on the ground that gave the university's original motto. And it was in Gothic script. It was a little hard to read, but she could make it out. She read it to her family. It said, piety and knowledge for the sake of Jesus Christ. And as she was Speaking those words out loud, a woman came up behind them and said, wistfully, it's too bad, but we gave up that mission a long time ago. Turned out to be a physics professor at that university who also happened to be a follower of Christ. And when our faculty member explained that she was from Wheaton College, this professor commented, you're different. You still have that mission. And I asked the question tonight, what has enabled us to survive and thrive in that Christ-centered mission? And so much of it is maintaining that strong sense of institutional mission at every level. If you had come here over 150 years ago when this college first started, you would have found a stone building on a little hill looking out over the railroad tracks. It wouldn't have been the whole Blanchard Hall that you see today, just the original part of that, the core of Blanchard Hall. And there would have been just a handful of students in those days who happened to be genius in Greek and Latin, education being what it was back then. You would have met a very serious looking president. You saw his picture tonight in the video. And you would have met people with an absolute commitment to the cause of Jesus Christ. Those who founded Wheaton College, when they first had a vision that God might establish a college in this place, net, knelt down right in the grass out on the, the hill that became Blanchard Hall, and they prayed 
that, would, that God would raise up for them a college that would have an impact on the world. And I believe that God is answering that prayer again tonight. This is one of the reasons why on this great night when we begin orientation, I always get goosebumps three or four times. I don't know about you, Paul, and yeah, we absolutely do because we love the mission of this place. It's so exciting for us to see people entering into that mission for the first time. We want Jesus Christ to be the center of everything here. Uh, you'll notice our foundation today, not just on the sign at the front of campus, but if you go to the Meyer Science Center, you'll see it engraved on the side of that building. The testimony that Jesus Christ, by him, all things were created, and in him, all things hold together. And if that's true, if all things hold together in Jesus Christ, then he is absolutely at the center of academic life. Uh, let me just say to you, uh, it'll be a little easy to get caught up in the excitement of these next few days. We actually do have school here. Uh, it begins next Wednesday. In fact, uh, we have five children. Uh, we've been raising them here in the Wheaton College community. One of my uh, sons, his close friends, are being raised over at Traber Dorm. Um, their parents are the RDs there. And uh, he was, I don't know, five or six years old. He said, Dad, where are all those students going? Well, Ben, they're going to class. You mean there's school here? <laughs> yeah, there is. There is school here. But Jesus Christ is not just the center of that. Your dormitory is a place where Jesus is known and served. Christ is the center of music and performance as we sing and play to his glory. The soccer field the volleyball court. These are places under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. This whole campus is sacred space, not just Edmund Chapel. Even the dining hall is a place where we invite the presence of Jesus Christ as we pray together and, and break bread together. It is in Christ that Wheaton College holds together. And understand that when we are talking about Christ, we're not just talking about our own personal relationship with Christ, but we are also talking about his work all over the world. From the beginning of his public ministry, right up until he ascended into heaven, Jesus was always teaching and preaching the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is simply the rule of God. And it is the plan of our Lord Christ that his dominion would extend over all the earth. That's been Wheaton's vision from the beginning. Our founding president, Jonathan Blanchard, believed that the kingdom of God was very near. This is why he was so opposed to slavery. It's why he wanted to be at a college close to Chicago as a gateway between East and West. He had a, a vision for, the, for what God was doing in the world. He saw a kingdom that would bring equality to all races that would lead to the worldwide worship of God. That's why the Blanchard family welcomed into their own home internationals and people from different ethnic backgrounds. How extraordinary that was in the 1860s. It is still our belief today that the kingdom of God is coming soon. It's nearer today for sure than it was in the days of Jonathan Blanchard. And it's our belief in the coming of this kingdom that compels us to reach the lost, to care about the needs of the world. It's why we rejoice that so many of you have come from places all over the world. Someone was mentioning this morning, some of you internationals uh, heard this, this year there will be students on this campus who have made their home in their growing up years in no fewer than 118 countries around the world. Now this is a gathering place, but then also Ascending place, and our, our prayer for you is that when you graduate from Wheaton College, not, not if, but when, <laughs> nearly all of you, it will be when, and most of you, it will be within four years or maybe a little longer than that. <laughs> but our prayer is that you will have a deeper love for Jesus Christ, a bigger vision of his work in the world, a clearer sense, and this has been spoken about this evening, a clearer sense of what God is calling you to do. You can't do everything, but you can do at least one thing for Jesus. Now, the way that we prepare you to serve Christ in his kingdom 
is by providing for you a liberal arts education. This is a second distinctive part of our commitment. I'll mention it more briefly. But this is a Christ-centered, I've already said that, but also liberal arts college. Uh, that was a word I, I grew up in Wheaton. My father's been teaching here for 48 years. Uh, I, when I was a little kid, I never understood what liberal arts was because liberal wasn't, wasn't such a good thing theologically in our house. <laughs> um, but we're using the word liberal in its oldest and truest sense, that which liberates. It brings freedom. Originally, in the Athenian vision, it would have been freedom to, to be a leader in a democracy. But we have a deeper purpose because we have a kingdom vision. We're citizens of an eternal kingdom. And we want to give you an education that helps you become more completely a person in Christ. A liberal arts education is a great way to do that. Exposure broadly to the humanities and the sciences, developing critical skills of thinking, listening, writing, speaking. Not necessarily preparing you for a livelihood, although I'll get to that in a moment, but really preparing you for a kind and quality of life. Now, of course, you're gonna go deeper in your area, in a particular area, the area of your major, although as you saw from our orientation committee, for a lot of you, it's gonna be more than one major, whatever those majors turn out to be. But we wanna give you a broad preparation through studies in art and music and philosophy and literature and mathematics and science and social science and theology for sure, and I could, commend this kind of education to you tonight for all kinds of reasons. I could commend it to you professionally. Most people these days are gonna change jobs multiple times. You're gonna need intellectual skills that are flexible enough to make those transitions over the course of a lifetime. Again and again, I, I read that what businesses are looking for today is people that have the kinds of critical thinking skills and writing and communicating skills that are cultivated through liberal education. But I could also commend this type of schooling as preparation for life in all of its fullness. I love the way that John Milton wrote about this, the author of the epic poem, Paradise Lost. He defined in his essay of education, a complete and generous education is one that pre prepares you to perform justly skillfully and magnanimously all the offices of life, both private and public. Uh, Milton was saying, look, this kind of education, it's not the kind that prepares you for nothing. In particular, it actually prepares you for anything and everything, to be a better citizen, a better neighbor, a better husband or wife, father or mother, a better housemate and team member and friend, and of course, also a better worker. And in a Christ-centered way, a better Christian. Our vision for the liberal arts is expansive in all of those ways, and we believe it is excellent preparation, not just for service, but for leadership in the kingdom of God. I have to say I was saddened to read not long ago in the description of the aims of another university this was a faculty member at that school saying, there is a powerful bias at this university against providing you with the truth about the important issues we study. Not only is there a powerful imperative to stay away from teaching the truth, but this university also makes little effort to provide you with moral guidance. Indeed, it is a remarkably amoral institution. And I would say the same thing, by the way, about all the other major colleges and universities in this country, end quote. I say I was grieved by that because it stands really totally against the kind of education that we want to provide here, which is centered on the truth in Jesus Christ and is profoundly a moral education that shapes the character of the whole person according to the character of Jesus Christ. I could commend Christ-centered liberal arts education for all of these reasons, but let me do it for this reason as the last of these reasons. Let me give it to you for the joy. I invite you to pursue the life of the mind 
with everything you have and to love all the disciplines of learning for the sake of your Savior, Jesus Christ. Because if it is really true that he is creator and redeemer of all things in heaven and earth, and if it is true that human beings are made in his very image, then everything we study in science, everything we learn about in the humanities, it will all be related to him. I find no greater joy in life than in using my mind to pursue the knowledge of Jesus Christ in all of its dimensions. I invite you tonight to learn in this way simply for the joy of it. And then finally, this is the third thing I wanna say about Wheaton, about what's distinctive here about our commitment as a college. And that is that we are and are striving to be a community of grace. I don't want you to think even for a moment when we are talking tonight about everything that is beautiful about Christ-centered education, and when we are really celebrating what we aspire to, I wouldn't want you to think even for one moment that this isn't a place where we have a lot of problems, that we're protected from sin here, that you won't be tempted here, that somebody here won't let you down or do you wrong, I expect all of those things will happen here. And I am reminded, importantly, and want to remind you that the gospel is for sinners. And so if there's one thing that we know about any Christian community, it is a place for people who know that they know how to sin. I like to say it this way, that Wheaton, Illinois is somewhere east of Eden and south of the New Jerusalem. Uh, don't forget that. Don't forget it tonight, don't forget it tomorrow, don't forget it the day after that. This is not the kingdom of God on, on earth in, in all of its glory. It's a place where people sin and need to be forgiven. And that's why we've been singing tonight about our need for healing and grace that we're con we confessed in our singing that there are times when we hopelessly lose our way. We, we come to God in our, in our weakness. And so before offering you a preparation that will enable you to do something for Christ, I want to remind you tonight about what Christ has already done for you. I want to remind you of what Jesus Christ did in a stable in Bethlehem when he entered into all of the struggle and suffering of the human condition. And what Jesus did on the dusty roads of Palestine, where again and again, day after day, he lived in perfect obedience to the Father and went about preaching the kingdom of God. And remind you of what Jesus did in the Garden of Gethsemane, when in bloody sweat, he wrestled with the Father's calling for his life and chose for your salvation. And I remind you most of all what Jesus did on the cross where he paid the price for all our sin and not just on the cross, but also into and then out of the grave, rising again in the power of eternal life. And let me remind you as well what Jesus is doing right now as he stands at the glory of the Father in heaven. And the scripture says, not just in one place, but in more than one place, it is his joy and privilege now to stand as an eternal intercessor at the Father's throne, which means that as we are gathered here tonight, the Lord Jesus Christ is praying for you. Having done everything that needs to be done for your salvation, he is now praying the outpouring of the grace of God in every way you need it on your life. Now, if all of that is true, and you had a savior like that, what would you want to do in response? What would your commitment be in response to his commitment? I would want my commitment to try to live in whatever way is pleasing to him, even if I knew I would often fail. And that's part of the commitment we make in this community is expressed in our community covenant not as something we do to measure up, but as something we do to live out 
the gratitude we have to God for the forgiveness we have in Jesus Christ. We freely promise to one another and to our Father God that we will live for his glory in every aspect of life, truth, purity, reconciliation, humility, service. We make a commitment to study the liberal arts in a community that is brought to life by God's grace and then to go out and do his kingdom work around the world until he comes again. That's the commitment we make to him because of the commitment he has made to us. It is my privilege to serve as the president of Wheaton College, and it is our privilege together to live to the glory of the Father in the name of Jesus Christ, by the power of his spirit, amen.